Jesus famously says, My yoke is easy and my burden light. And yet when we read passages like this, it doesn't seem easy or light. It seems difficult. If this poor guy on the side of the road, left half dead, was repellent to the priest and the Levite, what are we supposed to do? What's a 21st century analogy for this? Are we supposed to pick up mangled bodies from car accidents on 495 and then care for them on our own dime, taking them to you know, Innova Hospital or Holy Cross in Silver Spring, wherever? Is that what we're supposed to do? Seems like a very tall order. No, that's not what it's about. The whole point of this is you don't have to have extensive means to love your neighbor and to be a neighbor. And by the way, they seem to be reciprocal. Being a neighbor and loving your neighbor are kind of the same thing. Because remember, the, first, the man's first question was, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus, at the end of his story, asks him, who was neighbor to that man? So in other words, he, the man beaten up, was a neighbor, but you, we have to be a neighbor to a neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? It's not about having means. You don't have to be able to pay a hospital stay out of your own pocket. And let's face it, many of us, most of us here could not ever do that. We couldn't do it for ourselves without insurance. No. In the reading we heard from Deuteronomy just now, we're told... This command that I enjoin on you is not too much for you. It's not too mysterious or remote. It's something very near you, already in your mouths and in your hearts. You have only to carry it out. It has nothing to do with money or physical strength. What was different about the Samaritan when he came across the man. We're told the other two just sort of went to the other side of the road. The Samaritan was moved with compassion. He didn't just feel compassion. He was moved by it. Let me try to give you what might be a good 21st century analogy for this parable, the Good Samaritan. And this is, in fact, a true story. From December until May, I was helping out at our parish in Columbus, Ohio, St. Patrick's, and there was a woman who entered the RCIA program late. When we started it in the fall, she wasn't sure that she wanted to be a Catholic, and of course, many people who are thinking of becoming Catholics are torn. Should I, shouldn't I, do I believe all this? Can I ever believe this? This is a lot. Blessed Mother, the saints, the Eucharist. And then of course you have your friends and acquaintances who are saying you'd have to be insane to become a Catholic. But then this happened. Sometime in December before Christmas, she was at a Starbucks. Just forget that detail. I know, friends don't let friends drink Starbucks, but just, she went to a Starbucks. And there was a line about 14 people deep. It's a busy morning before work, and everyone's anxious to get their morning brew to get going, and all these well-heeled business people are standing in line, double-tasking, you know, with their cell phones and doing social media posts and everything. And it's going along. People just go through. Then all of a sudden, there's this old codger comes up. He's a, he doesn't seem to know what he's doing. He seems to be out of place. Maybe someone told me he, he could get Sanka at this place or something. And he seems totally out of place. And as soon as he steps up to the counter, the whole line seems to have this, you know, sort of whiplash. Like, what? What is this old guy doing? And he has to look at the menu. Everyone comes up before and they just know exactly what they're going to order. And this guy orders something completely square, like, coffee. <laughs> Not 
not espresso based, nothing with soy, just coffee. And everyone's rolling their eyes. Oh, and then he pulls out cash. And of course, you don't do that at Starbucks. Everyone pulls out their smartphone and you use Apple Pay or whatever, Apple Wallet or whatever, or you swipe a card. This guy pulls out three ones. And everyone's going. But then, and he's feeling, the, he's feeling the tension. Everyone in the room could. You could just, you sort of hear the groaning, the breathing through the nose, because everyone just wants to get to work. Who is this guy that's blocking the line? He, goes, he reaches for his coffee after he pays for it and gets his change, and it falls. It falls on the floor, right at his feet. And the man just looks down, and he's embarrassed, and everyone now, you can really hear the groans. And this woman was thinking to myself, thinking to herself, this is awful. This poor man. People are just staring at him. People are just angry at him. He just wanted a cup of coffee like everyone else. He didn't maybe, you know, have the correct mode for buying it, but she says, I have to do something. And she just comes forward from the end of the line, shouts to a girl behind the counter, throw me a couple rags, mops it up, pats the man on the back, says, everything's okay, it's fine, you're good, comforts him, um, and then they wind up, you know, of course, replacing his coffee, they gave her a free one for his kindness, but she broke the tension in the room. No one was gonna do anything. Who knows whether the people behind the counter were even going to say a word of, you know, that's okay. It's not a problem. We've got lots of that. It's basically just water. No. And as strange as the connection might be, she said to herself, I realized right then and there, our world needs Jesus Christ. I need Jesus Christ. And these people probably were not bad people, but there's a herd mentality. And when you're on your way to work, you're interested in the economy. And if someone, if some slower, sort of softer piece of the economy is holding things up, you tend to overlook the humanity of that person. You might even just want the guy to get out of your way, out of your sight. That's not human. That's not a world any of us should want to live in, even though that mentality is ours many times. When you're on the road, when you're in the store, whatever. It's hard, it's hard always to see every other human being as someone put there deliberately by God. Now, we're not supposed to go out and try to meet everyone in the world. That would be an impossible task. But let's just take this situation. I, I swear, that's a true story. This woman, get, there were tears in the RCIA group when she told this story and her reasons for entering. And, you know, everyone's, boy, is that plausible or not? Everyone was saying, yep, yep, I, can. I knew exactly what those people were thinking. I knew exactly what I would have been thinking. This woman knew that she needed Jesus Christ. Let's face it, she already had Jesus Christ moving her. She was moved with compassion to help him, and God is love. She was moved by God to step forward and take a very simple step, and yet something that was a powerful witness to so many people. You don't have to be a Catholic. You don't even have to be baptized to be moved by God's grace. Sanctifying grace comes through the sacrament of baptism, but there's other kinds of grace, what we call actual graces, moving graces. God moves the world as he wishes. He uses all kinds of people, unbaptized people, sometimes even bad people. Right? We're told in the gospel that Caiaphas the high priest said it is better for one man to die for the people than for the whole people to perish. And John says, he said this, as high priest this year, as a prophecy of what was happening. 
God used Judas. God used Caiaphas to put Christ to death for our sake. God uses bad people. We're not supposed to be bad people. We hope that God uses us as good people, as good instruments, not as bad. But God moves where he wishes. And it's too bad for us if we're blind to those movements. We are called to love our neighbor. We are called to reckon all other human beings as our neighbor. Whether we can ever come to know them and actually engage with them or not, that's not the point. But we will have many opportunities in our life without looking for them to love our neighbor. We cannot, however, love our neighbor unless we first love God. And that's why love of neighbor is the second commandment. Let's not forget that. We're taken up with the beauty of this story, this wonderful parable that Jesus tells about the unlikely helper that this man finds in the Samaritan. Samaritans and Jews had nothing to do with each other. Remember that? When Jesus in the fourth chapter of John's gospel draws near the woman at the well, she was shocked. Not just because men and women didn't normally speak to each other in public if they didn't know each other, but also because Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. The Samaritans used to be part of the, the Hebrew race, but they separated long before. And there was hostility and enmity between the Samaritans and the Jews, like the Hatfields and the McCoys. There was a feud. They loathed each other. And yet, it was a Samaritan, not the priest or the Levite, that helped this dying, would have been dead man. We cannot love our neighbor unless we first love God. There's a kind of love you can show to others, but how deep does it go? And how persevering can you be in it? It's one thing to see other people as maybe your social justice project, or maybe you're virtue signaling by you know, showing how big you can be and loving each other. None of our love is secure. No love that we have, whether it be between husband and wife, parent and child, friends, none of our human loves is secure without God's love first. His love for us and ours for him. Because we are naturally bent on putting something first in our life. Something has to come first. Something has to be our God. And if God is not our God, something else will be. And if it's a person, you will come to hate that person if you make them your God. Because they can never live up to God. Only God can be God. And if you put on someone else a weight that they cannot bear, they will disappoint you and you will come to despise them. If we do not have God first, and notice, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, all your strength, all your mind, all of it. Well, if we love in God with all of that, what do we have left over for our neighbor? All of it. Because we're called to love God and our neighbor with the same act of love. We are to have undivided hearts. We love God first and our neighbor in God. The neighbor's already in there. But we don't love them as God. We love them as a neighbor. Or as, love your neighbor as yourself. And actually, a better translation is love your neighbor as another self. Another you. Recognizing that just as God made you, God made him or her. If we truly love God, we must love what God loves. And that's not true of our friends. Your friends may have interests that you don't share. You don't have to love everything that your friend loves. But with the love of God, we do. Otherwise, we're not loving him as God. Because to love God means to love him who is infinite, 
in wisdom and power and goodness. Loving God means loving love itself. And if we don't love what God loves, we don't love God, not as we're supposed to. We're loving God as something less than God, as some sort of an instrument. Let's not think that we could ever fulfill this parable in our own life if we don't put God first. Not reliably, not over time, not always. Once in a while you might have some kind of little eruption of good feeling and you can do a lot of good there, okay. But was that done out of love? True love for a neighbor? Maybe whom you actually, and maybe, maybe this Samaritan actually couldn't stand Jews either, but he helped anyway because his love overcame his dislike. His compassion, his being moved by compassion, overwhelmed his just kind of natural enmity or hostility to Jewish people. We're not told that this guy was just, you know, full of good feelings for Jews. No, he did what he did because it was the right thing to do. And so must we. All of us have likes and dislikes. We're not supposed to foster our dislikes, but we're not supposed to just pretend they're not there. Loving is not an extreme form of liking. They're not the same kind of thing. Love is not like further out on the edge of liking. Like if you really, 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 really like something, we call it love. No. Our loves and our likes can be at odds. You can love those that you dislike. In fact, you must. That's why it's a commandment. It wouldn't make any sense for the Lord to give it to us as a commandment if love just sort of flowed from us. Ultimately, what we are expected to do and to be in this world is what we're supposed to be is other Christs. And Christ loved us even when we were in our sins, even when he knew that we hated God. And we are supposed to love those and to, as much as we can, care for them, perhaps even if it's just in words. And by the way, think of all the times we fail just to speak a word of truth to others. We're hardly going to be able to help, you know, put someone, you know, load someone in our car and drive them to the hospital if you're not even willing to, to speak to them. Love does not mean flattering others. It doesn't mean saying, oh, yes, you're so wonderful. You're good. You're so right. You're always right. There's a lot of error in the world, and there's a lot of enemies that Catholics have. We're supposed to love those enemies. That doesn't mean just waving the rainbow flag during June and saying, yes, we're with you. Might mean a word of correction. Might mean being a little like Jerry Stiller and saying, I've got a problem with some of you people. You know, Festivus? Remember that from, okay. I'm dating myself here. Festivus is his made-up holiday and around Christmas time when you celebrate your grudges, but we're not supposed to be, this is not supposed to be a matter of having a grudge, but it's a matter of speaking the truth. If we're supposed to love our neighbors, especially those who despise us, we should be willing, at least with those who are open-minded, to say, there's some problems here. It's not transphobic, it's not hateful to say, Men can't be women, and they shouldn't pretend to be. It's not homophobic, and it's not hateful to say, a man can't marry a man, and a woman can't marry a woman. That's just truth. We can't share a human society. We can't coexist in society with those who deny simple biology, not to mention morality. And we certainly can't live in peace, although many people would like to think we can, 
We can't live in peace in a society that wants to kill unborn children, or born children, or anyone. False peace is not love. Love requires clarity, as well as charity. Compassion does not mean a blurring of distinctions, a burying of truth. God is love, but God is also truth. God is mercy and justice, and together in Him, they kiss and they embrace. The rest of us who have a harder time holding them together must still try. We must never allow ourselves to either err on the side of harshness and alienating people, but we must also never flatter people in their error. We are given the gospel truth not to be hid under a bushel basket, but to shine forth, even if it might hurt someone's eyes sometimes from the brightness of it. When we die, we're not going to be asked before the judgment seat of God how, how many good deeds we did just because it felt good. Just because it felt good, you know, like doing good deeds because you have that little explosion of enthusiasm at the moment. No. How much did you love? How moved by you were compassion, even when you didn't want to be, even when you were resistant to it? This is what we, we will be asked. Did we love God with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our being, all of our strength, and our neighbor as ourself for love of God?